Chamber of Fellows and guests, please accept my thanks for the opportunity to speak to you about my research in your archive. Heather Rowland, Adrian James, and the rest of the staff have been incredibly helpful in my research, and I would like to thank them as well, including for taking many of the photographs I am showing today. I would also like to acknowledge the Social, the social Sciences, Arts, and Humanities Research Institute at the University of Hertfordshire for funding my research. I am a senior lecturer in creative writing at the University of Hertfordshire. And at the University of Hertfordshire, I have had experience in combining heritage and creative applications in many public outreach projects, working with museums and schools local to the University of Hertfordshire. And I've used both oral histories and historic documents to teach creative writing at the undergraduate level. But I was interested in moving this combination of heritage and creativity into my own research and writing. My husband, Joe Flatman, was made a fellow of the Society in 2008 and spoke to then Secretary David Gainster about the handwritten minute, handwritten minute books. When Joe told me about the minutes, the long continuity fascinated me as a writer, and I knew I wanted to pursue research in your archive. I also found it exciting that the archive had not yet been used for creative purposes, so the narratives within them and the potential of those stories were untapped. Visual artist Lizzie Rideout's work as artist in residence at the British Library inspired me as she drew on disparate artifacts from their collection. My initial plan was to approach the research with a very regulated method of exploration based on the mathematical literary formulas of the Ulipo, a French literary movement. My plan was that I would examine the minutes at 30 year intervals, starting with the first volume and moving up to the First World War. I would then complement the randomness of this selection with looking at key moments in history, such as the granting of the Royal Charter. I began researching in the archives in October last year, and the narratives in the archive very quickly proved to be every bit as exciting as I had hoped. But I also realized just as quickly that I couldn't use my 30-year interval method. The interplay between the fellows that came across from the meetings, from the objects they talked about, the text, were far too interesting and they continued. So something that was brought up in one meeting, perhaps months later another fellow would comment upon, usually disagreeing with the original fellow. Um, so my, I thought, I'll reduce it to 100 years, and then I thought, I'll reduce it to 50 years, and I kind of ended up with about 40. Um, so I'm going to talk you through some of the stories tonight, but I wanted to explain the next steps for the project. I'm writing a collection of short stories, drawing on the narratives from the minutes. But we're also planning to apply for an Arts Council grant to fund some storytelling walking tours that will begin at the site of the Mitre Tavern and then come to Burlington House. And these will be open to the public, throwing open the stories of the society to a wider audience. And a handwritten version of my stories will be deposited in the archive as well, so that circularity of stories from handwritten notes to a handwritten version of the stories I find quite pleasing. Um, so tonight, I want to share some of the stories, some of my favorite stories that I've found in the archives. I should also note that for consistency and ease, I'm referring to the members as fellows throughout, although I'm aware that term didn't come into use until the granting of the Royal Charter. So, um, on the 11th of June, 1752, Mr. George Edwards, quote, gave a print of his own doing of the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros seems likely to be Clara, who toured Europe for 17 years. Glennis Ridley, author of Clara's Grand Tour, travels with the rhinoceros in 18th century Europe, states that Clara was not on display in 1752. She cites that George Edwards later published a picture that he a draw, an engraving that he said he had done in 1752, but he published it in 1758 in the Gleanings of Natural History and showing the genitalia of a male rhinoceros where Clara is clearly female. However, Dr. Jan Bondison from Cardiff University has written of discovering this different print of a rhinoceros dated 1752 by George Edwards. It entirely matches the dimensions of Clara. Moreover, advertisements for a quote, noble female rhinoceros or real unicorn to be seen at the Red Lion Charing Cross were published in the Daily Advertiser 
from 20 January to 30 April 1752. And Bondesen posits that these prints would have been sold as mementos at the Red Lion. In the minutes itself, the complete lack of further explanation of just the rhinoceros suggests to me that all the fellows present knew of the rhinoceros being on display and had probably gone themselves. The text here reads, in case you can't quite see it, this rhinoceros, which I saw in 1752, was a female. It was about five and a half feet in height, 22 feet in circumference, and weighs 800 weight or a ton. The owner reckons it's about 14 years old. Clara did return to London in 1758, where she died, um, and they couldn't find anyone who had the skill to um, dissect her body, so no one knows exactly what happened to her body. And even by 1775, she still had some resonance. Boswell noted that Tom Davis described Johnson's laugh as being like a rhinoceros. This sword is on display in the Museum of London in its medieval galleries, and it's a sword and a replica scabbard. It has been presented not once, but twice to the Society of Antiquaries. On Thursday, 13 February, 1745, a Mr. Smith was admitted to the meeting of the society. And I quote, the society had noticed that Mr. Smith, who had contracted for digging up the ballast or gravel out of the river to mend the roads which are between the New Bridge Westminster and Southwark Main Road, attended below with the great sword he had lately found. He was desired to walk up with it, which he did, and gave an account of how it was took up about 80 yards above the center arc and above about eight foot deep in the bed of the river. He permitted a small sketch to be made of it and had the thanks of the society returned to him for his civility. And the image here is of, from the minute books of the sword. Moving forward nearly 100 years, on Thursday, 23 May, 1844, this is inserted in the minutes. Walter Hawkins, Esquire, exhibited to the society a sword discovered in the bed of the River Thames in 1739 in making the excavations for the piers of Westminster Bridge, extreme length, five feet, six and three quarters inches. The Connoisseur Magazine details that Walter Hawkins then gifted the sword to the Royal United Service Institution, who loaned it to the Museum of London in 1933, hence the article's publication. And this image is from that article. And the, or, the article cites two origin stories for when the sword was found. One from the 1844 Mets and Archaeology, one from Gaul's Sepulchral Monuments, which shares the origin story with the Minute Book from 1745. The Museum of London's website shares the Mr. Hawkins' version. However, it lists the discovery of 1742 and excavating the piers. All of the sword's descriptions and the different versions feature, feature this text on the upper mount, which translates as, I knew, I knew, and the dimensions match. So whatever version is true, they seem to be about the same sword. In 1739, however, Charles Labelle, the engineer responsible for the foundation of the piers of Westminster Bridge, published a short account of the methods made use of in laying the foundations of the piers of Westminster Bridge with an answer to the chief objections that have been made there too, which seems to have been quite a lot because the book was quite offensive. He specifically states that in February 1738-39, in digging the foundation, that a copper medal about the size of a half penny was found. He gives extensive details of the coin, its condition, speculates on why it was lost. And this seems to be a man who would have recorded a sword had it been found. In addition, on Thursday, 19 February 1740, a Mr. Smith is present at a society meeting. He showed, quote, a dagger, a sword, a black stone in the shape of a kidney, deer, and bullet's horns, with several other things found about four or five feet below the bed of the river and making the foundations for the new bridge at Westminster. When a Mr. Smith, who may be the same man coming twice, appears five years later in 1745, five fellows are in attendance who were also at the 1740 meeting. Martin Fulks, Charles Compton, Reverend Alan Cooper, George Virtue, and Joseph Ames. None of these seem to comment that the same sword has come back again, which leads me to believe that the sword in the Museum of London is probably found closer to 1745 during aggregates extraction, not in the construction of Westminster Bridge. The story fascinates me really for two reasons. One, that the fellow in 1844 clearly did not know that the sword had appeared before the society before. 
And two, that Mr. Smith, a contractor, felt that the Society of Antiquaries was the appropriate place to bring finds in possibly both 1740 and 1745. In addition to receiving guests, meetings often fe featured extracts from letters sent to the Society about objects discovered around the country. A letter from Mr. Robert Kay of Newcastle was read by Mr. Roger Gale on the 13th of March, 1734. Mr. Kay has lovely language. My fondness for antiquity is now revived by a silver table that has lately fallen into the hands of Mr. Isaac Cookson, a goldsmith in this town. It was found near Corbridge by some ignorant poor people who have cut off the foot in such a vile, barbarous manner that they have broke two holes near the table and they have broke a small piece of the corners too. He describes it in detail, with measurements, including speculating on the objects engraved upon it, including, near the last is a man with a bow in his left hand and an arrow in his right. Before him is an altar and a dog, I think a greyhound, near him. Behind him is a large spreading tree with an eagle perched upon it. There are also several small birds, but these are only struck with a chisel or punch. By 13 November, Mr. Vice President Gale is able to bring a drawing of the plate to this meeting. And I feel this is one of the stories I might have missed if I'd followed my 30-year rule, because it does get followed up on. One of the things I found rather surprising was the number of images within the minute books. I had this idea that it would be predominantly text-based, but the images often took up a lot of pages. For example, on Thursday, 25 January, 1753, Mr. Philip Carteret Webb, who was heavily involved in procuring the Royal Charter, produced to the Society copies of sepulchral inscriptions lately brought from Rome, which are placed in his garden at Busbridge in the county of Surrey. Four pages of these images follow, and they're quite large. Oh. And I like the idea of him bringing something home for his garden. The proceedings of getting a charter were expensive in many ways. And Mr. Philip Carter at Webb bore a lot of the cost initially. As well as the physical cost of the charter, the society made a number of key gifts to people in power in the run-up to gaining the charter. Some received a few prints, but they resolved that five of the prints would be too small a present for the Lord High Chancellor of Great Britain. So on the 28th of February, 1750, they, quote, directed Mr. Virtue to procure a complete set of prints of this society to be properly bound, and that Mr. Webb do, on the part of the society, present the same to the Right Honorable, the Lord High Chancellor of Great Britain, and then crave his acceptance thereof from this society as a mark of their devotion and respect for his lordship. Not only that, they left well more than half of the six volume blank of the minute books, which would have been very expensive, and they begin the new volume seven with beginning the first meeting after the granting of the charter. In addition to the objects and stories contained within the minutes, I found the interactions between the fellows to be fascinating. These interactions often concealed disputes in extremely polite language. An interchange of the 28th of April, 1757, between Mr. Emmanuel Mendez da Costa, a Jewish fellow, and Dr. William Stukeley over the translation of a single word from Hebrew was just such an occasion. Mr. DaCosta's letter is summarized in the minutes, but reported in full in fellow John Nichols' illustrations of the literary history of the 18th century. I take the liberty, with the greatest respect and submission, to inform you of a mistake in your paper of the Druids, read to the Antiquarian Society the 31st of last month. He goes on to assert that there is no such word in for tin in Hebrew, Closing with, I earnestly entreat your pardon, dear sir, for this freedom, and beseech you to continue me in your friendship, which I so greatly esteem. Dr. Stukeley, however, has his response contained in full in the minutes, albeit turned into the third-person point of view, and the language of the opening makes his opinions beautifully clear. As his endeavors in all he writes is to come at truth, and his inquiries are generally about times and facts very distant, he can therefore the better excuse himself if he chances to fall into an error, at the same time declaring there can be no greater pleasure to him than to have his errors corrected when done with the same view to truth and not for the sake of finding fault only, and therefore owns himself extremely obliged to his friend for his candid letter, which has so seasonably put him upon inquiring 
wherein he, Mr. Edling, Mr. DaCosta, had mistaken the point which he, Dr. Steakley, was pursuing. Dr. Steakley's response continues for three full pages of the minute books. <laughs> Mr. DaCosta eventually embezzles 1,500 pounds from the Royal Society. He is expelled from the Society of Antiquaries and ends up in jail, where he still manages to give scientific lectures. I'm not really sure how that worked. Um, whereas Dr. Steakley's life clearly ends very differently. A much longer running dispute came from the pages of the London Evening Post. On the 14th of December, 1754, the London Evening Post, Post, Post recorded that, we hear from the board of a learned assembly in Chancery Lane that there have been many times clandestinely filched away several papers of mighty importance by some persons not having fear of God before their eyes and instigated by the malice of the devil but whether these purloinments have been made by any of its unworthy members or visitors, being as yet a secret, it is hereby desired that such persons, whoever they are, natives or foreigners, would read their catechism and keep their hands from picking and stealing, lest they should be detected and justly exposed. On Thursday, December 19, 1754, five days later, the matter was raised at a society meeting with Dr. Breckenridge moving that, quote, a premium be offered for discovering the author of such illiberal treatment, that having felt the justice of the society's resentment and displeasure, he might learn that becoming measure of public respect and decency which so respectable a body should always be treated. Mr. Sergeant Eyre, however, moves that all members of the society present and all such others as shall be present for at every future meeting till St. George's Day be severally and publicly called upon by the secretary to answer with respect to their knowledge of the publication of the said article so that every member who chooses it may have an opportunity of honorably exculpating himself of the imputation of so foul an offense and that such as shall withdraw without answering or shall refuse to answer to the said question be noted down and reported to the society. It is worth noting perhaps that they do not seem agitated at all about there possibly being some missing papers. It is entirely about the reputation of the society. The questioning was carried out for several meetings, and it's always recorded, up to the point that Mr. Locker asked on the 13th of March, 1755, that it be minuted that he left early on the 9th of January from illness, not guilt. <laughs> The society responded by approving him a worth member thereof. Dr. Richard Rollison, picture here, however, always absents himself immediately before the process of exculpating begins. On the 6th of April, he died before ever exculpating himself. He had changed his will, so the society did not receive the collection of antiquities and a small estate at Fulham originally gifted in his will. Instead, he endowed a chair of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford, but made it a requirement that no fellow of the Royal Society or the Society of Antiquaries could ever hold the chair. And this ban remained in place from 1755 until 1857, when it was decided to be removed. Beyond the use of language, the personal disputes, and the subjects of their discussions from objects or text, um, I found the personalities of the fellows came through very clearly through the minutes, as you can see in some of the disputes that I've talked about. But Mr. Joseph Ames has fascinated me. He was elected in 1736 and served as secretary from 1741 to his death in 1759. He was a whopping ship's chandler, did not know Latin or Greek, and wrote that at times he felt ill at ease among the grander fellows. However, the entry for him in the Oxford Dictionary's National Biography incorrectly states that Ames only contributed once to the meetings of the society. He contributed many times, I'm not sure why that error is there, including this lovely drawing of Oakham Church in Kent on the 18th of October, 1753. And images of Oakham Church now show it is very, very accurate, and the tr there is still a small tree in front of the church. Um, the minutes identify that he visited the church on the society's holiday, and he also records the tombstone of Dr. William Harvey's mother, Joan. Quote, a chaste, loving wife, a charitable, quiet neighbor, a comfortable, friendly matron, a prudent, diligent housewife, 
careful, tender-hearted mother, dear to her husband, reverenced of her children, beloved of her neighbors, elected of God, whose soul rests in heaven, her body in this grave, to her a happy advantage, to hers an unhappy loss. Ames himself was buried in the churchyard of St. George in the East in Shadwell. I visited this last week, but I could not find his tombstone. In the 1880s, the churchyard was converted into the garden that it is now today, and some tombstones were preserved and kind of stuck around the outer walls of the garden, and some disappeared. The, apparently, the assumption is that they were buried in situ, but that's completely unknown, and no lists were kept of what graves were kept or not. And it seems ironic that a man who devoted himself to antiquarian research and recording artifacts would himself be removed from the physical remains of history. His tombstone, according to the literary anecdotes of the 18th century by fellow John Nichols, ended with, he being dead yet speaketh. Despite the loss of his tombstone, Ames and all of the fellows yet speaketh through the remarkable archives of this society, and I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to research within them. Thank you.